How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the James Loud Podcast. Today, I have two special guests that have already been on the show before. We have Steve D'Angelo. We have Uncle Rick, Mr. Richard DeLisi. How you doing? Oh, fine. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you guys for coming on the show. So Steve, as you guys probably know, he's a founder of Harborside, Last Prisoner Project. He's been on a bunch of documentaries and one project after the next. You've done a lot over the last 40 years for the plant. And you've also done a lot over the last 40 years for the plant in other ways. So thank you. Thank you guys for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with Richard. And it's, I think it's more like 50 years, right? 60 years for this guy. Yeah. So yeah, I sold my first bag of weed when I was 13 years old. I'm 65 now. Wow. Do you remember the, the wheat, the specific strain? Oh yeah. It was just Mexican brick weed. That was, you know, basically all that was available then. So you know, I bought a nickel bag and I rolled it into six joints and sold each joint for a buck and did that a few times and eventually started buying ounces and yeah, that, that led to greater things over time. Yeah. To Harborside. To Harborside eventually. Yeah. 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 Pretty wild. Long, strange trip. It's been a long, strange trip and a wonderful one too. So yeah. And then, uh, Rick, you, you did 32 years plus you did another five year stint right i did i did 33 10 calendars straight and yeah. maximum security prison state of florida yeah and you were over a plant over a plant over a plant non-violent were... non-violent charge over marijuana only and the worst part you didn't get caught for doing it you got stitched on right i i never got they never put their hands on me with with products yeah. it was all it was all a uh, uh, premeditated deal by the government right yeah to go after you yep and 32 years they gave me 98 yeah well and then when i met your son this this is in 2000 i think 11 and your your son he's your biggest advocate and said my father's going to get out of prison soon absolutely him and my nephew kenneth yeah and my daughter ashley and that was the first time i heard of you was in 2011 and i finally came home in 2020 yeah. It took much more time. I, I mean, my my children and my nephew, which I call my son too, mm-hmm. they were at it for 17 plus. Yeah. And then when, as soon as Last Prisoners Project got involved, it wasn't eight weeks, and I was home, right? It went, went pretty quickly. Yeah, it was fast. It was It was so rapid, I was like, I don't know if I was ready, you know, right? but I am now. I bet. I bet. And you've been able to enjoy cannabis quite a bit, and you have your own cannabis brand, Delicioso. Right. We we uh, have our own brand in Florida. We work with True Leaf. Yeah. Uh, we're in 130 stores in the state of Florida. It's really impressive. Yeah. It, it's so unbelievable that I'm actually selling it legal in the state that put me away for 98 years. That's yeah. what's pretty wild about it. Yeah. And they don't have no beef about it or any, you know, they don't even, I've been trying to get clemency since I've been home or a pardon or something. And well, and because it's state, you can't get a presidential. The, uh, pres- the president can't do it. Right. It's got to be, it's got to be uh, Ron DeSantis to do it. Mm-hmm. Or whoever replaces him. Or whoever replaces him. Right. And he's not big on cannabis. No, he's not big on it. Not big on cannabis in a good way. No. I think uh, we could expect DeSantis to uh, to probably attack cannabis. Yeah. And then, so Steve, how did you guys first meet? Because you guys have known each other for a long time. I think when I met you, you were talking about Richard and- Well, it was through Rick, right? It yeah. was, it was, it was um, uh, I think uh, I was late to Instagram. So I think it was like 20, 20- 12 or 2013 something like that that i actually got an instagram account up and it was somewhere in those first you know year or two after i had an instagram account that rick reached out to me and told me the story and it was uh even before we started last prisoner project that i think we started having that conversation um you know for me it was around 2017 that I really started thinking about Last Prisoner Project in a serious way because we just passed adult use cannabis in California in 2016, 
but not a single person got released from prison as a result of, of passing that legislation. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like the next step was, was actually doing something. And so, you know, from the beginning, uh, Richard was on the list of, of prisoners that I cared about. Um, cause I remember, right? Like I'm 10 years behind Richard. Okay. He was like the big glamorous airplane flying boat captain and weed smuggler who was bringing in these huge loads of amazing weed. And I was like this, you know, young dealer who was, you know, moving 50 pound lots and a hundred pound lots. And if, if I was lucky, I, you know, I could catch something on an offload from, you know, from a big smuggler, but that was kind of like my role model and who I wanted to be. And I remember it so well when the federal government started going after uh, all the big smugglers and laying down these RICO charges and these, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 98 year sentences. Yeah. And, uh, and it was then that we really knew that like the, the war was on, it was on. And what year was that roughly? The time I remember that beginning is when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, he appointed George H.W. Bush the uh, drug czar of the South Florida Task Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were the first people to put U.S. military AWACS up in the air to start patrolling the Caribbean. Yeah. And, and so what they did is they, in that time, there was a bunch of really great Colombian weed that was coming in, just phenomenal weed. It was coming in in these great big boat loads of it. Um, you could like go 12 miles outside of the, the coastal waterway in Florida and like a little cabin cruiser. And there would just be like six or seven ships there that you could buy weed off of. It was, it was really quite incredible uh, for a while. Um, Bush went in and targeted the big slow-moving weed chips yeah. and then allowed all of his Cuban buddies who had you know operated with them in the Bay of Pigs and other, you know, a fascist kind of undercover operations to bring in as much coke as they wanted. And that was the beginning of the crack epidemic. And that was when they started putting away people like Richard for decades. Yeah. So Richard, you got a lot of good stories. I've been able to hang out with you for the last couple of days and I've, I've heard some amazing stories that I wasn't able to get on the show the first time, but yeah. Um, stories about hanging out with the Grateful Dead, stories about partying in New York. You know, I think we got some of those on, but let's talk a little bit about some of the smuggling that you've done and some of the good times. It was always a good time smuggling as long as you got home and everybody was safe and no one got in trouble. Yeah. That made it a good time, you know? Mm -hmm. As far as the, the business part of it, it, it that was a great time. Yeah. Because I met so many people, I met so many people and so many characters through through my through my years of doing it. So what was the closest call of a load that actually did make it? You mean you mean like a close call? Yeah, like one that almost didn't make it but it made it. The first deal I ever did. Yeah. I went to Jamaica on a diving deal it was supposed to be that's what I told my dad to only you know because I couldn't tell my father what I was doing. So I said, you know, this guy's got a boat. And my father knew who the guy was. And he wants me to go and take care of the engine on the boat. And, and uh, I wound up, you know, going and down and doing it. That was the first deal. That was in like 1970. Yeah. So, you know, in 1970, you could drive a boat right up to the back of the house and unload it. No one no even cares. suspected anything. Right. You know, I mean, under three bridges, you know, <laughs> three bridges around the corners, you know, all, it, and we unloaded it right at my friend's backyard. Yeah. Uh, like in the canals and land. Yeah, like a regular yeah. canal in uh -huh. full Lauderdale. Uh -huh. And Pompano, actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I remember like, you know, going to those houses, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and like picking up hundred lots from these houses that would be right on the canals. And then in those days, just bring the boats right, right into the backyard of the, of the houses and the canals. Wow. Yeah. Wild. I mean, we had, we had a rope going one rope going down tied in the bells inside of inside of sail bags we had the the weed tucked in you know we didn't want to really make it look crazy so if anybody did see it and we just keep on pulling them up and they'd put them in the garage and then a 
a truck would back in, a van, and fill the van up, and the van would drive away, and then another van would come in, fill the van up, another van would drive away, and one would go, you know, they, they would all go to a certain spot. Yeah. And everything would get weighed at the spot, and then it would go into into cars, mm -hmm. and then it would go on the auto train or what? Go up would, to New York or wherever. Yeah, mostly New York. Yeah, New York and Chicago. Yeah. Well, then you started out in Jamaica. You ended up in Columbia. You had a plantation in Columbia for a little bit, coffee house or coffee plant coffee plantation. Yes. What happened was uh, me and my brother were driving around one one day. That this is how we got involved, actually. And we stopped in a 7-Eleven on Sample Road, and they, I seen the car trader, and then on the front page of the car trader, had a house for sale, a coffee plantation for sale in Columbia with beautiful two-story house. Yeah. So I asked, I bought the magazine, and I asked the girl behind the counter if she could please sell me a roll of quarters, and I went outside, and my brother said, what are you doing? I said, we're going to buy this house in Columbia. <laughs> they fucking thought I was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Six days later, we had the house. Wow. And we didn't even have passports when I took the paper off the thing. Huh. So we, what we did was, we went and bought tickets to go to Colombia without our passports, because you'd do it back then. Yeah. We bought two tickets for Colombia, and we went to the passport office. We left the, the airport, went to the passport office. And said to the passport office, "Hey, listen, one of one of our family members died in Colombia. We need to get down there right away. We had our passports in two hours and twenty minutes." Wow, doesn't happen like that anymore. No, I got out when I came out from prison. Yeah, took me twenty six days to get my passport. Wow. Yeah, I know people. It's taken a year and a half, two years to get passports now. Even people without criminal issues. But you guys remember a time, and this is before my time, where you used to walk through and there was no airport security. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story about the, one of my earliest arrests. Uh, yes, there was a time when you could just get on an airplane with weed or, or cash and you know go from point A to point B. And I was uh, working out of New York, um, bringing loads from New York down to D.C., and I was working for one particular character who has actually been in the news recently, but I'm not going to name his name, um, who um, desperately needed the $26,000 that I owed him, like so desperately that he couldn't wait for me to take the train the next morning. I had to fly there on the last flight out from Washington, D.C. to New York. Mm -hmm. And so I stick the cash in a, in a briefcase because that's all you had to do, right? I wrapped it up in like a little satin sheet or something like that. And I, I get to the airport and there's this machine at the gate that I'd never seen before. It was a metal detector. And they had this sign up there that said, this is this new machine to protect a uh, metal detector. And it's like, if you, you know, you uh, are not any under obligation to consent to a search, if you put your bag in here and it, and it alerts, you can either choose to take your bag and leave the airport or we can search it and you can board the plane. So I stupidly allowed the bag to go through the, the, the detector. It alerts. Um, uh, and they did not give me the option of leaving the airport, uh, with my bag. Uh, they arrested me and they seized all of the cash. And, and you know, that was, uh, that my first federal conviction. Wow. Yeah. Actually, my first and only federal conviction. Yeah. yeah and then we had Rick who, uh, was loading. How, how many pounds? Per load, would you guys take typically at the end? Yeah, I mean, in the in the beginning, and then at the end. In the beginning, um, I guess the the first load I did was um, four fifty on uh, in the sea plan. Yeah, I said something to my brother. I said, "Hey, listen, we we should definitely get our own transportation." Because we were having problems with it, we did like two or three deals with the with the with the seaplanes, mm -hmm. and the guy um, he stepped he stepped to my friend when we weren't around. And he said, "Hey, listen, I don't want you know I don't want to work with these guys, and and uh, I want to do something with just me, you know, me and you." Mm -hmm. And the guy says, "No, no, we can't do nothing with you." 
you can't ever even you can't even ever work for the leases again for trying to go behind their back. This this is my Colombian buddy, you know. This guy was like with me, yeah. And that was the end of that. And there was two or three people to try that. You know, you take them from New York, you bring them down there, you show them the whole deal, and then they go down there by themselves. They think they can. They think they can. Yeah. They think they can repeat it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they got some cash. But I don't know if you know, Colombian people are very loyal. Yeah. Very, very loyal. Once they hook with somebody, mm -hmm. and they see that you're a family type of person, and you're you're about making money and making sure that everybody's safe, there's no way that they're leaving you. Yeah, it's interesting over the years. I've had my experiences with that too. But at the end, I was bringing, you know, like 22,000. We'd load on a DC-6. Wow. DC-4. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, two, you know, like two half track the trailers full. We'd, we'd load the trailers with, uh, you know, half weed and half uh, plants. Yeah. The back part of the trailer would be loaded with plants. Front part of the trailer would be loaded with weed. About 10 tons. Actually, like 10,000 pounds in the front of yeah. both of them. Wow. Wild. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were just like, you know, these incredible, like, modern-day pirate heroes, man, who were, like, making it through all the radar, beating the Coast Guard, beating the U.S. Army. Yeah. Um, uh, and doing these incredible, incredible... And the weed was just, you know, it was extraordinary. I was I was buying probably some of the weed that Richard smuggled into New York, and it was uh, I paid three hundred fifty dollars a pound for it, which was two hundred dollars a pound more than I was paying for Mexican weed at the time. Wow! Um, and it was this just extraordinarily light gold, and when I say gold, it was like the gold and the logo on your cap, right? Mm -hmm. um, with these dark dark seeds in it, and just a terpene profile. This pining, joyous, amazing terpene profile. It was just some of the very best weed that I've ever, ever smoked. Strong. I mean, I haven't experienced true Colombian gold ever in my life. I've smoked Colombian genetics, sm Santa Marta gold. I've seen some really amazing stuff down there. Um, and the effect is always really strong. Yeah, I've smoked the the genetics to the claim that they're the real Santa Marta mm -hmm. gold, but I smoked the real Santa Marta gold. Right. And um, there was maybe those genetics are the same, right? But there was a, a method of harvesting and a method of curing exactly. that has unfortunately been lost, right? Yeah. Because the way they dried it and the way they cured it. Exactly. It? That was a very <laughs> important part of the deal with the gold, too, on how you dried it and prepared it. Yeah. So that sadly has been has been lost. Um, so it's going to take some enterprising, uh, creative uh, young people. I'm sure they're already working on it, and I've met some of them in Colombia, who are working to figure out how to bring that that type of cannabis back again. So nice. if it was done once, it can be done again. Um, re what is it? Reland racing the world. Reland racing the world. Yeah. There you go. Geoclimatizing the world. Geoclimatizing the world, man. I love that concept of yours. I think it's just so so beautiful. Yeah, I think we need to go back to the roots. You know where we came from and add diversity back in. I think we shouldn't be afraid of diversity. I think, especially with cannabis, the problem with uh, what's going on now is we're bottlenecking all these things. People like gelato. It's very popular. Everybody knows gelato. But uh, we get these guys crossing a gelato with the gelato, and they're genetically they're almost identical. And so what you're doing is actually taking away from the genetics, taking away from the vigor. And uh, we need to incorporate and not be afraid to incorporate other things that might not be popular for a little while. And listen to the plant, yeah. right? So the the plant is incredible because you can put her anywhere in the world and within a few generations, she will acclimatize herself to that particular microclimate and start producing a more optimal expressions of, of, of that genetic, underlying genetic material in, in a way that is much more rapid and, and, and efficient than most other plants around the world. Yeah. So the, the, the plant herself is calling upon us to plant her in different places to see what happens and to honor and respect uh, each of those varieties. So, you know, one of the things we always tried to do at Harborside was to create an ongoing role for the small grower. 
and and particularly for sun grown growers. And so, you know, one of the things that's still being worked on in California, but I think should be a feature of the cannabis industry globally is appellations, just yeah. like you have appellations of origin for wine and for some types of cheese and other agricultural products. We need that for cannabis and appellations of origin that, you know, require the seeds to be actually grown in the soil and underneath the sun of that particular microclimate. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the genetics are. You could take something and grow it in one place. You can go sometimes as, as little as five miles and get a completely different expression. You can go a thousand miles and you wouldn't even recognize it as the same thing. You know, that's, and that's the beauty of the plant. And, you know, it, it's all these environmental variables add to not only the story, but the amazing qualities. Yeah. And it's very, you can get these unique expressions and some stuff is meant to be grown in the highlands and some stuff is meant to be grown coastal. And, you know, I, I'm big on exploring what should be grown where and with all these different genetic lines being able to go test out in these places and see what does better in what place. And, you know, I think th that's the beauty of it too. It seems like the islands, like the, the Hawaiian islands, yep. they would rather, the plants would rather grow on the ground than inside. In other words, inside grows. I didn't see one there. Hmm. I didn't see one inside grow all the time I was there. And I seen three different grows. Yeah, I mean, let's be clear about why we started growing weed indoors. We started growing weed indoors because the government started sending helicopters and found our outdoor farms. It, it wasn't because we thought we were going to grow much better weed indoors. No, no. In fact, that was contrary to the hippie ethic of doing things as naturally as, as we possibly could. And the actual real reality is that you will never, no matter what light is created, be able to get the kind of fullness of terpene expression that you can get from the under the sun from an artificial light. It's just not going to happen, right? right. So I think that uh, that 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 we were right then, right, and and that moving forward, this is why appellations are so important, right? Mm -hmm. That once we really do go through this process of re-land racing and 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 geo. Climatizing. Geoclimatizing yeah. strains for the ideal microclimates mm -hmm. and then protecting them with appellations. Yep. That's going to be the most desirable weed. Not some weed that was grown in a grow room that you could grow that exact same weed with that exact same expression anywhere in the world. No, App optimizing those environments with, yeah, optimizing the cannabis for those environments and finding out what works the best and, you know, and exploring those you know those those uh, those paths with different genetics, and really see what performs best in what region. And you know there there and there's there's a lot of mystery there. There's a lot of mystery to be found. And you know it, it's it's amazing because all the genetics we're working with came from six things. You know the six six regions. So basically everything that we have that we're smoking today, the modern cannabis, pretty much came from these six plants or six regions. I, I would imagine that there are parts of this globe uh, that, have, um, that have been very difficult to get to because of civil conflict and other reasons where there are still other basic building block varieties of cannabis yet to be found. So For sure. Infinite fun, right? Mother Nature was so wise and generous with this plant. There are so many different uh, possible combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids mm -hmm. that it's just this treasure chest that we're going to be opening up and playing with both from a, a spiritual point of view and a pharmaceutical point of view yep. for as long as I can imagine into the future. Talking about cannabis, right? tell me how cannabis benefited your life. It made me feel wonderful. Yeah. It paid my bills. Mm-hmm. It's going to grow my my name, Delicioso, on, on, on my uh, incorporation. Um, I think is just going to grow incredibly fast now, because I think people are realizing the people that put the work in before it was just you know you could come with money and do it now. Right. You know we we set the groundwork and we 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 made sure that when we did it that it was going to stay around. We didn't. We didn't do it just for the moment. Mm -hmm. We did it forever. 
Yeah. And I'll be doing this till I die. You know, this is my thing. This is what you were meant to do. You know, I was meant to do this. Like, you know, cowboys were meant to be gunslingers and all that stuff. I, w- I was meant to be a smuggler. It was, it, was, it, was, it was part of my bloodline that my grandfather was a bootlegger. My father worked for my grandfather. So if you look down to generation to generation, someone in my father's family was going to be not legitimate and that was that happened to be me and i was i've been doing this since i was like i guess 14 you know it, it was 14 i was 14 years old and and i was in the business big time by the time i was 18 four years later i was you know driving like brand new cars and you know beautiful apartments yeah and no one knew where, where it would, i was so undercover they were like how has this guy got two motorcycles? You know, a Harley and a Triumph. You know, brand new. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. But it was it was like a it was like just a smooth. You know, it was like I could give someone a million dollars worth of weed and shake their hand and say, "Man, I'll see you in two weeks." They didn't have to give me anything. Just drop I drop off like eighteen thousand pounds, and eighteen thousand pounds would be over a million probably. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I would just shake their hand, and that was that. Today, it's like, you know, you can't do that no more. It's not, it's not possible. Right. Unless you're with, with people that you grew up with. Like you said yesterday, I'm with my friends that I grew up with. Yeah. The only people that I could really trust is the people that I grew up with and, and some great people like I met now, like Steve and people like you that I don't, you know, they know, they know that. They know I ain't saying anything. Mm-hmm. If a cop grabs me and tells me, yeah, you know, you're going to get 80 years, but I'm going to give you two if you just tell me about the guy down the street. I tell him, hey, man, you go talk to the guy down the street. You don't talk to me about him. Right. That's the way everybody's getting in trouble now. It's, they just give up people, you know. To, they don't know what they're, what they're involved in. You know, I always sat my guys down before we did a deal. I said, you know, I'm going to go do this deal now. You guys are going to make, you know, you're going to all load the plane. You're all going to make 25 grand for half hour work or 50 grand for half hour work. But there's a consequence. If you get caught, you're going to jail. Right. And you got to keep your mouth shut. But obviously, a lot of people don't do that, Mm -hmm. especially people from South Florida. Yeah. Well, I was shocked. I mean, after spending the first 30 years of my cannabis career in the legacy market where, you know, routinely millions and millions of dollars traded on a handshake. And yeah, occasionally things went sideways. People went bad on you. It it happened, right? But usually it was rare that people went into a deal with you like that with the intention of ripping you off. It was usually because something happened to them and and there was a cascade of consequences, right? So I was really shocked when I started sitting down and doing mainstream business and actually having written contracts, right? Oh, those guys are the worst. Well, see, I thought that the contract was actually this attempt to come to a mutual agreement mm-hmm. where everybody would understand what the terms were and it would be very clear with each other so that you would avoid conflict, right? Then I learned that there's this whole cadre of mainstream business that writes contracts deliberately so that they can set you up to be screwed a little bit later down the line. And they use the most obfuscating, confusing, unclear kind of language as they possibly can and then rely on the courts to enforce some kind of unfair deal. Right. And I was just like, I was shocked that people would choose to spend their lives that way. It's like when you could do business honestly with people and shake their hands and feel good about it, why are you going to spend your time writing up all of these bullshit contracts designed to cheat people? Right. It was just... Well, and now nowadays, you want to work with people that you could do a handshake deal and you need a contract. It's like because... It's just, it's there's a lot of bad actors out there and a lot of bad people, you know. And it's people that are in it for the wrong reasons. I think when it was more dangerous and there was more consequences on the legal side, there was a different crowd of people. You had to have some balls. It wasn't about how good is your lawyer. It was like, okay, we're gonna commit to doing something. We're gonna do it. 
And, and now, if you got money, you could pay to play. It's a pay to play sort of thing. And people don't realize the importance of quality. That's another issue with the industry today. And I think you guys both understand quality. Uh, you know, Steve and Harborside had some amazing quality. For those of you that have seen the Harborside of today, it's not the Harborside that I grew up knowing. The Harborside I grew up knowing was the place that set the standard for clones. If you wanted good clones, Harborside had the best clones. They had the best quality. Dark Heart, originally Dark Heart had the best clones, you know, and Harborside, they, they sold Dark Heart clones, but you would take them and they were picture perfect clones and they had perfect roots and you guys would reject tons of stuff. But I remember going to Harborside and it's like, if you wanted flower, they had all different tiers of flower, but the top shelf back in the day, you wanted some Chem 91, some Sage and Sour, you wanted some good top shelf flower, it was available there. And the stuff was better on average than you could find in most dispensaries in California today. Most uh, results flow out of intention, right? And our intention was to create a temple for cannabis and a community space for people who loved cannabis. And, yeah. you know, we found ourselves in this very fortunate place in California where it was, you know, still a gray market. It wasn't fully legal by law, it was nonprofit. So the big corporations didn't want to come in. And we had this breathing room. And we created this really amazing system, right? Um, there, Nobody made intergenerational wealth or not very many people, right? But everybody in that system from 1996 until 2018 was taken care of. Farmers could afford to buy the land they were growing on and send their kids to school. Patients could come into dispensaries and get the very best weed in the world at really affordable prices. Yeah. People who worked in dispensaries had the best jobs that that they'd ever had in their lives, right? Um, uh, everybody was well taken care of uh, in that system. I mean, there was counties in the Emerald Triangle that their whole economy was based on cannabis. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole economy, all of it, everything. You know, if you lived up there, if you didn't participate, your spouse, your neighbor, the kids you went to school with, their parents did. I mean, it, it, you know, it was such a big deal. And now that's kind of changed, unfortunately. Because a lot of those people were the ones that helped build the industry as it is today. You know, guys like Richard, we got the cultivators. You know, I, I think I've done my part. You know, I've been around since the 90s and very passionate about cannabis. But, you know, and it's a, it's a group effort from so many people in so many directions. And, you know, we were, we were at dinner last night talking about how tough times are and how yeah, for, for me, it's all about being grateful for where we're at and what we have. And if you start getting too caught up on the bad part, you you forget how, you know, we're living in a time that weed is, marijuana is legal. We can, yeah, it's pretty much legal, federally, whatever, but you can go on the joint, you can smoke a joint on the street and they're not going to give you shit for it too, too often. Um, you're not going to get locked up over a joint. That's for sure. Well, it's this incredible, uh, in my opinion, spiritual revolution that we're undergoing now where literally hundreds of millions of people all around the world have been called into conversations with this plant. Yeah. And out of those conversations, we have uh, learned the same lessons. And out of those lessons, we've built a common value system, right? So wherever we are in the world, we value creativity over conformity. We value individual freedom over submission to authority. We value nature over industry. We value peace over war. We value love over hate. We believe that every living creature and, and every inanimate object made by nature has a place and a purpose in this world. And that's who we are. Whatever language we speak, whatever race we are, whatever religion we follow around the world, uh, plant people follow that same path. And so uh, it's this incredible time. Um, where we now have the opportunity to introduce ourselves to each other and yeah. think about it. It's like, we've all been called. We've all been called by the same plant. What's she want us to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you listen, the plant will tell you. The plant will put you in the right direction if you listen. This is the reason that governments and religions are so terribly terrified of cannabis. Because when we engage with that can that conversation with cannabis, it is a direct conduit to Mother Nature. It is a direct conduit to the 
divine. And the messages that we receive from Mother Nature, from the divine, carry a greater authority than any man-made authority will ever have. And this is why uh, authoritarians have always been so hostile towards cannabis. Yeah. So you've been in Hawaii lately. We were talking about Hawaiian weed a little bit. Yeah. How, how's it over in Hawaii? The Hawaii is like, my son lives in Amsterdam. Yeah. So when he moved to Hawaii, I said to him, um, well, how do you like it? He said, Dad, I moved from the swamp to paradise. Yeah. And, you know, I've been to Hawaii a few times. I spent some time there. I lived there for about six, seven months. Um, I never did any time in, my aunt, I, in Maui. But this time, you know, he wanted to make sure that I seen most of the the great things that it offers the, the island, you know? And it was, I mean, I went fishing. I, we caught like over 500 pounds of yellowtail tuna. Wow. Then we went hunting. We got a we got a Angus cow, three hundred pound. I mean, we could have got a fifteen hundred pound if we wanted to, but we only had a certain amount of time to clean it because I had to come to California. You know, we were, and I met this great guy, Patrick, that's got a farm there. Richie met him like a semi accident. It was almost that they met each other, and and the people that worked for him and the people that took us hunting, and and Patrick took us fishing. You know, yeah. It was it was um, quite an experience, Hawaii this time. It was, it was a whole new deal for me. When you said you saw some sour diesel there, that was really good. Wow, purple. Purple sour diesel. The bottom of the leaves were purple. When I lifted the leaf up, I said, holy cow. Yeah. I said, I want some of this right now. I said, well, you know, I won't be ready for a little while. Yeah. But um, I wound up getting a few things from him before I left. Nice. Excellent. And then Jason Harris, uh, he's over there. You know, what happened was, well, I'm there, right, and I'm talking to my friends, and they're like, hey, uh, Maui, Maui, is that? Uh, uh, uh. So I said, don't worry, I'll bring something back for you guys, you know? Yeah. So interesting enough, I got Maui, Maui when I was in my teens, probably 16 years old or something like that. And we got this Maui, Maui that came in and it was velvety. It was lime green and it was velvety, like spongy, velvety, but it was part of the texture. And this stuff was amazing. It was, it definitely would lift you up. And the effect is what I remember the most. I don't really remember how it tasted, but I remember the way it looked because it was like- Remember how super sticky it was? It was super sticky. Yeah, it was super sticky. I don't really remember the smell though. But I do remember the way it made me feel, and it was super, super uplifting. It was strong, but uplifting. Yeah, it was. A, it's a happy weed. Yeah. The very first, um, what we called then Cincinnia, the very first domestically grown weed that was good, as yeah. opposed to what we used to call gronies or homegrown, which was really, really badly grown <laughs> weed in yeah. the beginning. Um, was in 1974 in New York City when uh, I bought a pound of Maui Waui for $1,200. And, uh, and again, it was like this incredible sticker shock, right? Because like I was used to paying 300 or 350 for the Colombians. It's like $1,200 for a pound of weed. It's like, I don't care how good this weed is. I'm not paying $1,200 a pound for it. And then the pound was put in front of me, and of course, I did end up buying it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, New York has always been infamous for the expensive pound prices. Well, and it's playing a role in, in what's happening in New York right now and the, the difficulty of, uh, of getting a, a workable legal system in New York, right? Because New York has always been the place where if you had a load of really good weed, you take it to New York because you're going to get top dollar and you're going to turn it fastest. Right? Oh, so, God. You know, always go to New York. There's would... no place that you could move weed like you, like you could in, in New York. So consequently, New Yorkers got used to having the best weed in the world. And because it was a competitive environment, they ended up paying, you know, high prices, but not ridiculous prices for it. Became very particular consumers. Mm -hmm. And and that whole network that was developed to serve those consumers um, is now the legacy market in New York. And you've got a bunch of um, uh, MSOs who really don't know anything about cannabis 
who are now trying to compete with that network with weed that they're growing in New York. Right. And uh, it's not going too well for them so far. Well, most of your weed was moved in New York, right? I mean, some in Miami, some other place, but New York was the- I didn't sell any, any weed in Florida. None in Florida? None. All in New York? Or or all, it either went to New York or Chicago. Yeah. Wow. And I used to sell the whole load for 250 a pound. You know, if you took 18,000 pounds, you pay 250. If you if you were a kid that grew up with me, yeah. which the guy that used to take the big load, he grew up with me. But if, say, like like my next door neighbor wanted 250, I'd give him, I'd give him 250 pounds for $250 a pound just because, you know. Right. Or one of my friends that might have been a fireman or a cop in New York, I'd give them 250 a pound, you know. Yeah. Well, and then so your price was what a hundred, and then you're you're doubling it, you're two point five x, or what was your cost you're in maybe thirty bucks a pound or something? Oh, not even. For, wow, it was like it was like yeah, eight dollars a pound or something. When you know, cause it, yeah, we, we had to just figure we had to figure the guy you know, the plant to the guy that's watching it. Da, da, da. Sure, that's how we figured it. We didn't. We just figured, well, it's going to cost to grow this field. It's going to cost us 20 grand. Yeah. All right. That field's 30,000 pound field. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's deep and long, you know? I mean, yes. So when when you break it down, if you're getting 30,000 pounds and you're only paying 20 grand, what are you actually paying for each pound? You know what I mean? If you break it down all the way, it's like it was peanuts. Sure. It was like pennies on a doll like type of thing, you know. You pay more money to to bribe the people you need to bribe to get the load out of the oh, country yeah. than you paid for the week. Yeah, sometimes it used to cost me thirty grand just to get out to the desert. Well, you know, I'd be driving along and there'd be a there'd be an army stop. Mm-hmm. I jump out of the truck with a shoebox for five hundred pesos. So when I say Oaxaca, what comes to mind? What's the first thing that comes to mind for you guys? For me, um, the it's the most indigenous uh, state in Mexico, and uh, that was that was the best yeah. the best smoke to come out of Mexico too. Ever smoke, mm-hmm. yeah. Oaxacan was the best ever smoke, and the best part was I had the connection when I was fifteen. Wow. The wise guys in New York had the connection, and my friend knew the wise guys, so I used to go over to the Manhattan Beach Hotel. And I'd buy pounds of Oaxacan for 20 bucks a piece. Wow. In New York. Yeah. So this is in the early 60s. Sure. But 20 bucks a piece, but I had to buy a whole suitcase. You know, like 20 of them or 30 of them. Yeah. Nice. Wow. <laughs> I wish I had that connection back then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> God, it was, and, and, and you know, we would sell them for like 150. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was, I was paying. If I got a pound of Mexican in Washington D.C. for 120 bucks, I was thrilled. If I was paid 150, I was okay. If I had to pay 160 or 165, I was kind of not so happy about it. What I mean, right. the people that I would sell to, to 250, like my friend, mm-hmm. he would double his money. But that was a Colombian. Yeah, the Colombian. Yeah, that's totally different. Yeah, he would double. He would double his money. He'd buy it for two fifty a pound, and he'd sell it for five hundred. Wow! And, and I drop mean, a few ounces for three here and there. Oh, all day long. Yeah. And then, and then he, he'd try me on the twigs and the seeds. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? He said, "Oh yeah, I'd like uh, eighty pounds of seeds and twigs." <laughs> I say, "Well, knock it off the bill." So, how did they do the brickweed? How did I brick it? How did, well, how did, yeah, how did you brick it? I had, I, I had two book presses that I bought in New York, put on an airplane and sent down there. Book presses? Yeah, book presses. Wow. I would, I would do like, they were this long. Yep. You know, there's two regular Colombian bells were like that and about that high, right? But they were that long, about that high, I guess about, yeah, about that high, that was 20 pounds. Hmm. Pressed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then I wrapped That's them. Pretty light. Press. I wrapped them differently. You know, they'd be wrapped in brown paper with a little plastic around them, and they'd be stacked into the burlap bags. Yeah, and it would be like 
perfectly, you know, the burlap size. Yeah. In Mexico, we used to, uh, we would build boxes, right, of the size that we wanted the bales to be, and then we'd use auto jacks and uh, put the jacks in and then um, use hydraulic jacks to press the, the weed. Wild. Into the, and then, and then do the, and then do the wrapping. And the price of the weed, but mm-hmm. uh, that, that, or at least, you know, I would take the same weed and I would press it in three different levels of pressing and they would end up selling it at three different prices. So like the pillow press was just like barely compressed. The buds were still really, really nice, but took up a lot of space in the vehicle. So the price was higher. And then you could like compress it down and get it to like half of that size, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or you could just smash the shit out of it and get it down. And that, was the, like that was the problem paper. with the Jamaican. Mm-hmm. Whenever you got Jamaican, it was never pressed. Mm-hmm. It was loose in the bell, you know, it was bell stuffed with by hand. Wow. So a bell like this big was like 40 to 45 pounds. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But the quality of the Jamaican stuff was really good, no, or no? no? Really, so Jamaica. So if you had to rate the different regions, how would you rate the the top? Colombian being the top, Thai would be the top. Thai would be the top. Then Colombian. Okay. Then, depending on the era, Jamaican or Mexican. In the beginning, there was a time when there was good Jamaican that was better than most of the Mexican. But over time. The Mexicans got much better at, at growing good weed, while the Jamaicans kind of stagnated. Well, Jamaicans have improved. They have improved, yeah. but 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 still, um, mm-hmm. most people I know who go to Jamaica bring their own weed with them. Yeah. The, the Oriental people in Jamaica are the ones that got the weed up, and you know they got the quality of the weed up. Hmm. Mostly Chinese people growing it. There's, there's the thing, the cool thing about Jamaica is it's, it's, you know, usually thought of as just this black nation, right? But it actually, you know, has all different kinds of cultural strains from all over the place. And, uh, and, and most of them have dabbled in, in cannabis here and there in one way or, or another. So, yeah, I mean, the, the all around the world, the quality of cannabis is is increasing, right? Mm-hmm. Because the knowledge is more freely available now. And I mean, there are, you know, there's lots of Jamaican farmers who would, you know, love to be visited by some good American growers and 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 have some lessons and put them oh, to yeah. to good yeah. use. This is a really interesting time uh, globally. Let me jump back to the crippy. Yeah, let's talk about the crippy a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your experience with the crippy? So, I, 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 I don't even know if it's the same thing we're talking about, right? Yeah. But in Colombia, right, there is a region in Colombia where most of where there's a huge amount of commercial weed production that's still going on. Right? Uh, there's a village called Toribio, which is one of the the centers of that production, and and creepy basically is Dutch uh, hybrid indicas, right, that were brought uh, into a jungle environment, right, where they never would have naturally adapted. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they are, and it's a twelve twelve environment, right? So first, the 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 in order to get the buds to flower, they're vegged under light, and then you turn off the light to get them to start to get them to start uh, flowering. But um, but they lose about half of half to two thirds uh, to bud rot before they're able to harvest it. And in order to cure it, because the, the, the conditions in the jungle there are so humid, in order to cure it, they put it in these ovens, these gas-fired ovens, and actually basically cook the weed. Oh, man. And then this weed is shipped to Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, and other markets in, in Latin America. So amongst my Colombian connoisseur, cannabis friends, crippy is a, is a derogatory term, not a complimentary term. Wow. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, they say fire now or whatever the terms are for the hype, the hype stuff, you know, the hype weed. And Crippy, uh, to my knowledge from Mango and from Craig Coffee from High Times that have both been on the show, was that was the good stuff in Florida. And w- what's your experience with the Crippy? I've always loved it. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but I never could put a handle on it where to get it or find it, you know? And I mean, there was never abundance amounts of it. You know, I mean, 
I know Chris, you know, Chris is Sunshine, uh, mm-hmm. Sunshine Cannabis. He's a real big crippy guy. Like he's like says like he started crippy, but we know that he didn't start crippy. But he has, you know, his quality in crippy with, with True Leaf is, is quite amazing. Yeah. You know, um, it's, I never, I never could f- get a handle on it. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, you know, try to get my hands on like 50, 100 pounds at a time of this stuff, but it, I never seen it like that. Right. So you're talking back in the day. Oh, yeah, back in the day. It was, the it was 80s, years, probably. Okay, because I never heard about Crippy until I went to Columbia in 2019. Oh, so, no, this is, I'm talking about in the 70s. Right? 70s and yeah. Crippy. Totally missed that. Like, well, yeah. And I mean, Jeep, you could light Jeep up a J and you could Jeep, smell Jeep. it a block away. Hmm. I mean, a, like it was so strong. When you rolled it yeah. in a room, you had to have the windows open. Well, I smoked plenty of weed like that, but yeah, no, so right, but crippy. this was so serious, like burnt tires. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you guys. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, look forward to having you guys again. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. You know that. Yeah. So tell the audience where they can find you. Uh, if you want to find me, you can find me um, at steve.d'angelo, D-E-A-N-G-E-L-O on IG, uh, stevedangelo.com. Uh, and you can keep up with my latest project, um, which is a, a retreat center in a Rastafari village in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Uh, and that one is at R-I-V Retreats on IG. And Richard, how can uh, I find you? Keep in touch with me at freedelisi.com, uh, delicioso. That's yeah. The way Instagram to, to keep with me and to yeah. follow me, you know. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us, James. Thanks for uh, bringing this history to light and keeping it alive. Yeah. Look forward to doing projects with you guys in the future. Yeah, man. <laughs>